Rasselas, Prince of Abysnia, Chapter 12, The Story of Imlac, Continued. I am not yet willing, said the prince, to suppose that happiness is so parsimoniously distributed to mortals, nor can I believe but that, if I had the choice of life, I should be able to fill every day with pleasure. I would injure no man, and should provoke no resentments. I would relieve every distress, and should enjoy the benedictions of gratitude. I would choose my friends among the wise, and my wife among the virtuous, and therefore should be in no danger from treachery or unkindness. My children should by my care and learned by and pious, and would repay to my age what their childhood had received. And what would dare to molest him who might call on every side to thousands enriched by his bounty, or assist by his power? And why should not life glide quietly away in the soft reciprocation of protection and reverence? All this may be done without help of European refinements, which appear by their effects to be rather specious than useful. Let us leave them and pursue our journey. From Palestine, said Imlac, I passed through many regions of Asia, in the more civilized kingdoms as a trader, and among the barbarians of the mountains as a pilgrim. At last I began to long for my native country, that I might repose after my travels and fatigues in the places where I had spent my earliest years, and gladden my old companions with the recital of my adventures. Often did I figure to myself those whom, with whom I had supported the gay hours of dawning life, sitting round me in its evening, wondering at my tales and listening to my counsels. When this thought had taken possession of my mind, I considered every moment as wasted which did not bring me nearer to Abysnia. I hastened into Egypt, and notwithstanding my impatience, was detained ten months in contemplation of its ancient magnificence and inquir inquiries after the remains of its ancient learning. I found in Cairo a mixture of all nations, some brought thither by love of knowledge, some by the hope of gain, many by desire of learn living after their own manner without observation and lying hid in the obscurity of multitudes. For in a city as populous as Cairo, it is possible to obtain at the same time the gratifications of society and the secretude of solitude. Secrecy of solitude. From Cairo I traveled to Suez and embarked on the Red Sea, passing along the coast till I arrived at the port which I had departed twenty years before. Here I joined myself to a caravan and re-entered my native country. I now expected the caresses of my kinsmen and congratulations of my friends, and was not without hope that my father, whatever value he had set upon riches, would own with gladness and pride a son who was able to add the felicity and honor of the nation. But I soon convinced that my thoughts were vain. My father had been dead fourteen years, having divided his wealth among my brothers, who were removed to other, some other provinces. Of my companions, the greatest part was in the grave. Of the rest, some could with difficulty remember me, and some considered me as one corrupted by foreign manners. A man used to the vicissitudes is not easily dejected. I forgot after a time my disappointment, and endeavored to recommend myself to the nobles of the kingdom. They admitted me to their tables, heard my story, and dismissed me. I opened a school and was prohibited to teach. I then resolved to sit down in the quiet of domestic life and address the lady that was fond of my conversation, but rejected my suit because my father was a merchant. Wearied at last with solicitation and repulses, I resolved to hide myself forever from the world and depend no longer on the opinion or caprice of others. I waited for the time when the gate of the happy valley should open, that I might bid farewell to hope and fear. The day came, my performance was distinguished with favor, and I resigned myself with joy to perpetual confinement. Hast thou here found happiness at last? said Rasselas. Tell me, without reserve, art thou content with thy condition, or dost thou wish to be wandering and inquiring again? All the inhabitants of this valley celebrate their lot, and at the annual visit of the emperor invite others to partake of their felicity. Great prince, said Imlac, I shall speak the truth. I know not one of your attendants who does not lament the hour when he entered this retreat. I am less unhappy than the rest, 
because I have a mind replete with images, which I can vary and combine at pleasure. I can amuse my solitude by the renovation of the knowledge which begins to fade from my memory, and by recollection of the accidents of my past life. Yet all this ends in sorrowful consideration that my acquirements are now useless, and that none of my pleasures can be again enjoyed. The rest, whose minds have no impression but of the present moment, are either corroded by malignant passions, or sit stupid in the gloom of perpetual vacancy. What passions can infest those, said the prince, who have no rivals? We are in a place where impotence precludes malice, and where all envy is repressed by a community of enjoyments. There may be community, said Imlac, of material possessions, but there can never be community of love or of esteem. It must happen that one will please more than another. He that knows himself despised will always be envious, and still more envious and malevolent, if he is condemned to live in the presence of those who despise him. The invitations by which they allure others to a state which they feel to be wretched proceed from the natural malignity of hopeless misery. They are wary of themselves and of each other, and expect to find relief in new companions. They envy the liberty which their folly has fortified, and would gladly see all mankind in prison like themselves. From this crime, however, I am wholly free. No man can say that he is wretched by my persuasion. I look with pity on the crowds who are annually solicited, soliciting admission to captivity, and wish that it were lawful for me to warn them of the danger. My dear Imlac, said the prince, I will open to thee my whole heart. I have long meditated an escape from the happy valley. I have examined the mountain on every side, but find myself insuperably barred. Teach me the way to break my prison, and thou shalt be the companion of my flight, the guide of my rambles, the partner of my fortune, and the sole director in the choice of life. Sir, answered the poet, your escape will be difficult, and perhaps you will soon repent your curiosity. The world which you figure to yourself smooth and quiet as the lake in the valley, you will find a sea foaming with tempests and boiling with whirlpools. You will be sometimes overwhelmed by the waves of violence, and sometimes dashed against the rocks of treachery. Amid wrongs and frauds, competitions and anxieties, you will wish a thousand times for these seats of quiet, and willingly quit hope to be free from fear. Do not seek to deter me from my purpose, said the prince. I am impatient to see what thou hast seen, and since thou art thyself weary of the valley, it is evidence that my former state was better than this. Whatever be the consequence of my experiment, I am resolved to judge with my own eyes the various conditions of men, and to make deliberately my choice of life. I am afraid, said Imlac, you are hindered by stronger restraints than my persuasions. Yet, if your determination is fixed, I do not counsel you to despair. Few things are impossible to diligence and skill. Chapter 13 Rasselas discovers the means of escape. The prince now dismissed his favorite to rest, but the narrative of wonders and novelties filled his mind with perturbation. He resolved that he had heard and prepared innumerable questions for the morning. Much of his uneasiness was now removed. He had a friend to whom he could impart his thoughts and whose experience could assist him in his design. His heart was no longer condemned to swell with silent vexation. He thought that even the happy valley might be endured with such a companion, and if they could range the world together, he should have nothing further to desire. In a few days the water was discharged, and the ground dried. The prince and Imlac then walked out together to converse without the notice of the rest. The prince, whose thoughts were always on the wing, as he passed by the gate, said, with a countenance of sorrow, Why are thou so strong, and why is man so weak? Man is not weak, answered his companion. Knowledge is more than equivalent to force. The master of mechanics laughs at strength. I can burst the gate, but cannot do it secretly. Some other expedient must be tried. As they were walking on the side of the mountain, they observed that the conades, which the rain had driven from their burrows, had taken shelter among the bushes and formed holes behind them, tending upward in an oblique line. It had been the opinion of antiquity, said Imlac, 
that the human reason borrowed many arts from the instincts of animals. Let us therefore not think ourselves degraded by learning from the coney. We might escape by piercing the mountain in the same direction. We will begin where the summit hangs over the middle part, and labor upward till we shall issue out beyond the prominence. The eyes of the prince, when he heard this proposal, sparkled with joy. The execution was easy and the success certain. No time was now lost. They hastened early in the morning to choose a proper place for their mine. They clambered with great fatigue among crags and brambles, and returned without having discovered any part that favored their design. The second and third day were spent in the same manner, with the same frustration, but on the fourth day they found a small cavern concealed by a thicket, where they resolved to make their experiment. Imlac procured instruments proper to hew stone and remove earth, and they fell to their work on the next day with more eagerness than vigor. They were presently exhausted by their efforts, and sat down to pant upon the grass. The prince for a moment appeared to be discouraged. Sir, said his companion, practice will enable us to continue our labor for a longer time. Mark, however, how far we have advanced, and you will find that our toil will have some end will have some time have an end. Great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. Yonder palace was raised by single stones, yet you see its height and spaciousness. He that shall walk with vigor three hours a day will pass in seven years a space equal to the circumference of the goal, globe. <laughs> they returned to their work day after day, and in a short time found a fissure in the rock, which enabled them to pass very far with little obstruction. Rasselas considered as a good omen. Do not disturb your mind, said Wimlack, with other hopes or fears than reason may suggest. If you are pleased with this prognos with the prognostic of good, you will be terrified likewise with tokens of evil, and your whole life will be prey to a superstition. Whatever facilitates our work is more than an omen. It is cause of success. This is one of those pleasing surprises which often happen to active resolution. Many things difficult to design prove easy to performance. Chapter 14. Rasselas and Imlac receive an unexpected visit. They now wrought their way to the middle, and so lost their toil with the approach of liberty. When the prince, coming down to refresh himself with air, found his sister Nekaya standing before the mouth of the cavity, he started and stood confused, afraid to tell his design, and yet hopeless to conceal it. A few moments determined him to repose on her fidelity, and secure her by her secrecy a declaration without reserve. Do not imagine, said the princess, that I came hither as a spy. I have long observed from my window what you and Imlac directed your walk every day towards the same point, but I did not suppose you had any better reason for the preference than a cooler shade or more fragrant bank, nor followed you with any other design than to partake of your conversation. Since then, not suspicion, but fondness has detected you. Let me not lose the advantage of my discovery. I am equally wary of confinement with yourself, and not less desirous of knowing what is done or suffered in the world. Permit me to fly with you from this tasteless tranquility, which will grow yet more loathsome when you have left me. You may deny me to accompany you, but you cannot hinder me from following. The prince, who loved Nikaya above all his other sisters, had no inclination to refuse her request, and grieved that he had lost an opportunity of showing his confidence by a voluntary communication. It was, therefore, agreed that she should leave the valley with them, and that in the meantime she should watch, lest any other straggler should, by chance or curiosity, follow them to the mountain. At length their labor was at an end. They saw light beyond the prominence, and, issuing from the top of the mountain, beheld the Nile, yet a narrow current, wandering beneath them. The prince looked round with rapture, anticipated all the pleasures of travel, and in thought was already transported beyond his father's dominions. Imlac, though very joyful at his escape, had less expectation of pleasure in the world, which he had before tried, and of which he had been wary. Rasselas was so much delighted in the wider horizon that he could not so soon be persuaded to return the, to the valley. He informed his sister the way was open, and that nothing now remained but to prepare for their departure. Chapter 15 The Prince and Princess Leave the Valley and See Many Wonders The Prince and Princess, 
had jewels sufficient to make them rich whenever they came into a place of commerce, which, by Imlac's direction, they hid in their clothes. And on the night of the next full moon, all left the valley. The princess was followed only by a single favorite who did not know whither she was going. They clambered through the cavity and began to go down on the other side. The princess and her maid turned their eyes toward every part and seeing nothing to bound their prospect, considered themselves in danger of being lost in a dreary vacuity. They stopped and trembled. I am almost afraid, said the princess, to begin a journey of which I cannot perceive an end, and to venture into this immense plain, where I may be approached on every side by men whom I never saw. The prince felt nearly the same emotions, though he thought it was more manly to conceal them. Imlac smiled at their terrors, and encouraged them to proceed. But the princess re continued irresolute that till she had been imperceptibly drawn for forward too far to return. In the morning they found some shepherds in the field who set milk and fruits before them. The princess wondered that she did not see a palace ready for her reception and a table spread with delicacies. But being faint and hungry, she drank the milk and ate the fruits and thought them of a higher flavor than the products of the valley. They traveled forward by easy journeys. All being all unaccustomed to toil or difficulty, and knowing that, though they might be missed, they could not be pursued. In a few days they came into more populous regions, where Imlac was diverted with the admiration which his companions expressed at the diversity of manners, stations, and employments. Their dress was, of, was such as might not bring upon them the suspicion of having anything to conceal, yet the prince, whenever, wherever he came, expected to be obeyed, and the princess was frightened because those that who came into her presence did not prostrate themselves before her. Imlac was forced to observe them with very great vigilance, lest they should betray their rank by their unusual behavior, and detain them several weeks in the first village to accustom them to the sight of common mortals. By degrees, the royal wanderers were taught to understand that they had time laid aside for their dignity and they were expected only such regard as liberality and courtesy could procure. And Imlac, having by many admonitions prepared them to advance, endure the tumults of a port and the ruggedness of the commercial race, brought them down to the sea coast. The prince and his sister, to whom everything was new, were gratified equally at all places, and therefore remained for some months at the port without any inclination to pass further. Imlac was contented with their stay, because he did not think it safe to expose them, unpracticed in the world, to the hazards of a foreign country. At last he began to fear lest they should be discovered, and proposed to fix a day for their departure. They had no pretensions to judge for themselves, and referred the whole scheme to his direction. He therefore took passage in a ship to Suez, and, when the time came, with great difficulty prevailed on the princess to enter the vessel. They had a quick and prosperous journey from Suez, travel by land to Cairo.